Let me see if I can find your. Well, OK, so we're online. Uh, welcome, everybody. Let me see if I can uh, fix my video a little bit. Welcome to today's show. We have our guest, Guy Needler. He's an author, and I don't have his bio in front of me. So would you please, mm -hmm. um, since I'm not totally prepared for this, would you please give your own short bio? Well, um, basically, I am a trained electrical electronics engineer, mostly from the automotive industry. And I've, but I've always had a, so shall we say, an interest in metaphysics. And um, as a result of that, I've investigated lots of things metaphysical, including doing lots of meditation. When I was a very young, young lad in my teens. I was doing the meditation in the morning and I was visited by four entities that looked like human beings, but um, clearly weren't. They looked like they white robes, but it could, have been just, it could have just been energy. And they told me that what I was researching into was right. Um, but really, it wasn't the right time. So I had to, well, basically, I didn't have to. I just did. I just stopped doing the, the, the intensive meditation I was doing and became the average human being. And it wasn't until later that um, uh, I was going, I went back to college to, to study an MBA. And one of the students I was with asked me if I was interested in doing Reiki. But um, I started to get back interested in, in metaphysics. I eventually went through five years of tra training, not just Reiki, but um, also energy healing based upon Barbara Brennan's work for one of her first generation students. And um, that, along with the the visitation of a friend to in in um, Sweden to go and see them, ended up I ended up having a download one day when I was meditating um, during the walk that we had, and that together with the healing started to create a situation where I was going to different levels above the levels that we were taught to go to with the healing, and um, eventually I managed to create a process that allowed me to. Uh, judge where I was in what I've discovered was a multiverse environment and communicate with other entities and go back there in a repeatable and robust way. And uh, so I started to write all the information down because I was given a, I'll say a gift of almost total recall of what, of what, was, what I was experiencing. And uh, eventually I, dis I discovered the information I was getting was not seen in anybody else's books. And so I thought I'd compile a book and that took basically from the end of the healing to when I first sent my manuscripts out to, to about 60, six or seven different publishers was probably around six, six, six years. So when I finished the book, um, sent it out in about six years. This and was your first book? That was the first book, The History of God, yes. The History of God. Mm. And uh, you said you you encountered uh, three or four beings. What were they? Uh, describe well, them they, again. They told me that I was part of them, and they were sort of part of me. That we were all part of the same energy. What did uh, they look like? Well, they they gave a sort of humanoid image, but it wasn't clear. If that makes any sense? It was sort of blurred, and they but they were a shape of a human. Yeah, yeah. But I think that was just to give me something to focus on, because I, I guess if they presented themselves as being what I would recognize now as being entities that, that are pure energy, at that time, I wouldn't have understood what I was seeing. So it was quite quite interesting that they, they presented themselves in, in a human form to me. And what were you doing at the time they appeared the first time? I, well, basically, I was doing what I was doing quite a lot, which is meditating in the morning before I went to, to work. And, and which style of meditation was it you were using? Well, it was based upon um, a meditation that was seen in a book called You Forever by a gentleman called Lobsang Rampa, who was quite well known in metaphysical fields back in the 70s. And uh, this, this book was a book that was supposed to be 
a correspondence course, apparently, but it ended up being a book anyway. And he, in, in the book, he, he, he showed exercises or lessons on how to do things like telepathy, psychometry, um, even telekinesis, a, a meditation was one of them, and astral traveling as well. So I was studying all of these things and using the principles as he got. Um, but later yep. on, I developed my own, I developed my own processes as well. What was the name of his book? Do you remember? The first, his book was, um, I'm not sure what number book it was that he, he created, but it was called You Forever. It's still available, but it's, um, it, it's I think it's, it's in reprint. I don't think it's from, from the, original, the original publisher. It's in, um, it's in reprint. And you had no other training other than reading his book? No, nothing at all. And what, can you describe the technique you were using at the time the bean showed up? Well, basically, it was to <laughs> do something that now I wouldn't do, which is lie down. Because <laughs> if you lie down, you fall asleep. Um, right. And it's also, I mean, the other sort of Indian gurus or, or Hindu gurus say that you should, shouldn't lie down. You should always meditate sitting in posture with your back straight. Um, but this, this gentleman said lie down and just gradually withdraw the, the energies or the, the focus of the mind on the body so that you just became the mind so you'd move it all all your focus or your attention away from the, the toes and the feet and the legs and then you move them away from the fingers and the hands and the arms and then focus on the central body then bring it up towards the head and then just be in the head and then go beyond the head and that's basically what it was i mean the, the, the book i think the book is still available but it's not from the original publisher it's because you to amazon does these so you you withdraw your attention from your body until you're in your head only. Yeah, and then move out of the head. But that was then. I mean, now I just I just go where I need to go to because I developed a process that was aligned around <clears throat> going through different levels of energy of, of energy uh, initially through opening the chakras and then going above the frequencies associated with the astral levels of those associated with the rest of the physical universe and into the other frequencies that is basically the, the, the structure of the multiverse the environment and the other universes within there. So you have your own technique now. What, describe your technique. <clears throat> well, my, well, my technique that I teach people, which is the basic um, building blocks, which leads from a structured approach to an unstructured approach when, when it becomes advanced, is really to open the chakras one by one and when you open the chakras one by one basically you elevate your in your frequencies associated with that chakra to that level so when you move beyond the seventh chakra which is the crown chakra i then started to use well, basically a stair staircase and i would mentally walk up the staircase and each floor would be another frequency or another level and when i got past the 10th frequency or 10th 10th level because i discovered there was 10 frequencies or energy levels associated with the, with the body, with the creation of the body, there's two more associated with the physical universe, because I established that the physical universe was created through the use of 12 of these frequency levels, and that it's the only universe that does need 12 frequency levels, because above the 12th and the 13th, we go into a different dimensional condition, and it's finer, more, much more finitude. So I could then use a mental lift to go from there, uh, and eventually I, I managed to open the chakras all in one go and, th and then use the staircase and then go in the lift and then eventually I just go go in the lift and then eventually I just go there and so now I, now I can just go to wherever I need to. So how many levels of reality are you aware of at this point in time? Well <clears throat> these are static universal conditions and um, Parallel conditions are something else which, which are part of or created through choice um, from entities or ent from an entity or entities within, within a different universal environment. So, but the static condition, um, there's 408 frequencies, which are, that only creates 397 universes because the first universe needs 12, 12 frequencies. But the, in terms of the number of realities that, or, or event spaces, as I'm told to call, told to call them, there are Unlimited. There are countless tens of thousands, millions of them, depending upon how we create things, our choices. You know, for instance, if you're using um, a train to get from one point to another point, 
and you get off the train, you turn right, you could have turned left and you might bump into different people. So your experience becomes twofold. Although you're focused on the one, another part of you is created to experience the other potential that's there. And, and, and those potentials are augmented by other entities who enter into that particular p possibility. Be and that, and they, they become part of it, or you become part of theirs. And then, and then the more and more individuals are part, part, you know, become part of it, this reality, you create a much bigger reality or event space. So you gave me a number. What was the, give me the number again? There's 408 frequencies within. Okay, so yeah. the, for, let's start with the frequencies so we don't get too. Yeah, there's 408 uh, frequencies within 12 full dimensions, but there's only 397 universes. Okay, so tw let's back up 12 dimensions. So I think of, um, okay, so the way I've tried to visualize or uh, perceive it, ra rationalize it, is with X number of uh, planes of existence, like the physical plane, which is not really physical, we both know that. And then, uh, or the plane we're on, let's say, let's call it the plane we're on. And then above that, you got the astral plane. And then you've got uh, causal, mental, etheric, and on and on up to the, the echis say there's a, there's a line in the middle and everything below that line is duality. And everything above that line is non-dualistic. And I don't necessarily go with what the echis say, but that's, just uh, an example of what I what I try to rationalize when I try to perceive different um, not uh, planes of existence. Right now, dimensions to me, I think of a dimension as um, like like with Marvel, it's the multiverse, you know, different universes. But dimensions could be. Um, I've I've gone through other planes and dimensions, and I'm not sure if I'm not confusing the two. But uh, let me give you um, let me give you an example. Okay, I was um, how do I put this? I was in Peru. I did the ayahuasca. It opened me up psychically. I was open for a couple of years and had a lot. I saw a lot of um dark um let's just say i was like a super psychic and i was seeing people's um the symptoms of their attaching spirits i would see people's eyes um moving around really fast in their head and i knew that it wasn't their physical eyes it was their their etheric causal astral the, some other body you have is, it was that part of them where the eyes were moving around i knew their physical body wasn't doing it, but it looked to me like their their physical eyes even though i could couldn't tell it wasn't okay so during that time there were um events where i actually changed from this um Timeline. I always call it a timeline. It's, it's the easiest way to think of it. This timeline to a different timeline. And on the other timeline, I still got my wife, but she looks di very different and not as pretty. And the circumstances were different, but not uh, not hugely different. You know, Hitler didn't win versus Hitler lost. That sort of thing wasn't there. But there were a lot of uh, extreme, a lot of other differences which were very obvious, but but tiny, but, you know, l less on a world scale. So the, I look at that as multiple timelines, and I went through a few of those and then got back eventually back here. And I think my desire or choice to take this incarnation, that frequency pulled me back to here from all those other places. Now, that's one thing. And then uh, at some point, I found myself in a jail where they were mind 
mind screwing me. And in that experience, uh, a side a side note from the mind screwing, what I experienced in that jail was a point where I would like um, where I would listen carefully. If I listened really carefully, I could go into this other dimension or realm or whatever, like a like a level that was slightly above this one. And on that level, I was I was personally on trial and all these w different things were happening. But I couldn't perceive that unless I really focused on it and mentally. Uh, you know how we have our mind chatter. We're mm -hmm. just constantly in this mind chatter. I had to stop all that and just sit there and be aware and listen and actively listen to what was a, out, something you never do. And if I did that, I could pick it up and I could go into that plane. And so you have all these different constructs that we you know we call timelines dimensions planes multiverses and it's really confusing to try to wrap your mind all around mm -hmm. so my next question to you all of that verbiage is a preamble for the question is how do you see all of that and how do you categorize everything and and, and when you do it try to do it in the sense how you learned that whatever it is that you wrap your mind around that well i eventually got it wrong well it's so eventually got, eventually got it right but i started it wrong i categorized it all in 100 le levels and i was allowed to do that until i realized because it because it allowed me to move up and down but i was obviously jumping between different i was not going one two three four i was going one to seven for instance and then moving up but eventually i realized it wasn't 100 levels it was it was more structured than that so the, the more so the multiversal environment that I discovered was based upon 12, these 12 full dimensions. And I discovered that each of the dimensions, apart from the first one, because it houses the lowest frequencies and therefore houses, <coughs> houses the, the physical universe and behaves slightly differently. From the second until the 12th, they all behave the same way. They split out into three sub-dimensional components and each of those sub-dimensional components split it out again into, into 12 frequency levels or frequency bands. And each of those frequency levels or frequency bands created the, the potential for and did create a, a universal, a simultaneous universal environment in its own right. That's not parallel, that's something which is like, it's like a static function. So I re recognize that <clears throat> there was 11 times 3 times 12, which is 396 frequencies and therefore 396 universes. But the first one was an anomaly and I didn't discover that until my the, the texts or the meditations that created the second book, Beyond the Source Book One, where I found out that the, the anomaly that was there was the, was the, the first dimension. Um, these aren't dimensions that science thinks about because they say we're in the third dimension now, but that's just a measurement of volume, you know, height, width and depth. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so the first full dimension, although it was split out into three sub-dimensional components like the others, because all the frequencies were so low, it collapsed back into a composite subdimension, which only allowed 12 frequencies to create it. But all those 12 frequencies were required because they're all so low to create the possibility of a physical of a universe. So the first full dimension is rather unique because it's it's the only universe that's got one, sorry, it's the only full dimension that's got one universe associated with it. And the physical universe, therefore, is the only universe that's got 12 frequencies associated with it. And so there's a potential within the physical universe to have different, so say, levels of content within the same space, because we exist in the first three frequencies that creates the gross physical. There's the other four above that, which I call the spiritual physical, but they are effectively, in old speak, the lower astral, the upper lower astral, the lower upper astral, and the upper astral. I mean, one of those words of describing that was the old Hindu ways of saying you know, things like the causal, for example. Um, so there was my understanding that there was 12 frequencies that created the physical universe. So 12 frequencies plus 396 creates 408, but only one extra universe, so 397 universes. But in understanding this, I started to understand that this was simply a <clears throat> compartmentalized area in a, a, a what I call now volume of sentience and energy. 
And that volume of sentience as energy is where we exist. And that volume of sentience and energy is what we call our creator, our source. God, if you want to call it that. And so because this was a compartmentalized area, there was structure above it. So there's other things like zones and continuum and lots, lots more above that, up to the up to the 12 levels, which weren't part of our creator, our source, because it was part of the, the first four levels of structure. So there was structure beyond that, part of something which a much bigger environment. And so, and so it took quite a, bit, quite a bit of time for me to understand that <clears throat> we are just a small unit of individualized sentience and energy that has been individualized from a larger entity which we would call our higher self or our Godhead in Hindu texts, or if you read Dolores Cannon's book, books, the, uh, the Oversoul, but it's basically, it's, it's our higher self. And above that is another, another larger entity, which is what we call our, our source, our creator. And the, so our higher self, if you want to call it that, is the major individualized unit of sentience and energy that was individualized first from our source. So we have source, we have our higher selves, then we, then we have the smaller individualized units of sentience and energies come from the, the higher self into the body so that we can experience the multiversal environment. And my understanding was that the, the multiversal environment was created by this division within, the, within itself of the, of the source, and it created these smaller units of itself to, to to experience the minute detail of itself, but it can't do itself. You know, it's, it's a little bit like us trying to see with our physical eyes what, what we can only see with an electron microscope. You, you've uh, you've explained the the understanding you came to. If you could spend a few minutes or as much time as you want <clears throat> to to go through, I guess as briefly as possible, that. You don't have to really be brief. I'm just trying to get as much detail as possible as far as how you got from, uh, I guess, those three guys that said that you're a part of them to where you are now, as far as if you could go over the whole, whole um, <laughs> all of it in a logical, quick, brief, like a bullet. Okay. Well, this happened. And that gave me an understanding of this, and then this happened, and that gave me a, you you know where I'm coming from, right? Yeah, yeah. So once I'd had this visitation and was told that what I was researching into what I knew was right, but it wasn't the right time for me because I had to learn some earthly things, to get some earthly experiences. I was just basically carried on like everybody else. You know, tried to get better qualifications, tried to get better roles in my work. You know, became became the average human being. Then, during one of my um, secondary education courses, which led to more to getting an, an MBA, one of the students invited me to go to a Reiki share, and that sort of started to reawaken things. I went to the Reiki share a year later. I popped out the other side as a Reiki master and started to get reintroduced to it and re re to say reinvigorated my interest <clears throat> at the sort of same time i was experiencing a little difficulty with the the mathematics surrounding the the, the work i was doing so i went to see a, a healer and that healer um, was a first generation student of Barbara brennan and although the the healing worked um and and it sort of sorted out my ability to see things straight you know rather than getting confused by things so I was trying to do too much too fast, which is because you know when you're in the energies, you you can do you can do everything instantaneously. But here, you, it's all linear. You do one yeah, do one thing and then the next thing. Right. So, so I, I was in. She said she said I'm going to do a course the same as Barbara taught me. It's going to take four years. Are you interested? Uh, I said okay, I'll have a go. And there was another five or six of us on this course as well. And over the next four years, we we learned how to. You know, what I call traverse the frequencies to go up, up through various the seven levels to active to you know, by opening the chakras we could actuate healing on the different energy templates that create the human form and heal the chakras and heal parts of the the, the, the auric layers and and all sorts of you know, other things like heal the organs. But on part part of this was 
also channeling information about the, 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 the clients so we could do bespoke healing as well. And whilst we were doing this, I was moving up the frequencies further than the first seven frequencies associated with the, you know, the, the gross physical and the spiritual physical aspect of the human body. And um, I was told that that's not appropriate. <laughs> we're supposed to focus on the human body and wherever I was going to, I needed to control it. So having been told off a few times in class, I decided that I was trying, I would research outside of class where I was going to and see if I could go back there and and repeatedly go back. So I created a number of different ways at first, very slow. It took me half an hour to three quarters of an hour to go up to what I call the 36th frequency level. Um, and then I'd spend five or 10 minutes there, then have to come down and then go to work. So I was spending an hour and a half going up the frequencies and coming down, but only about five or 10 minutes getting information. But that information was was quite detailed to the point where I would go to work and lunchtime I'll get total recall because I was given this this, this, um, this gift of total recall and was able to write it all down. Now, the sort of in, in, in parallel with this, another friend of mine was working in Sweden and he was also associated with, with a, another another individual, another Reiki master, and she said that I've got that I've got to go to Sweden to see him and that there was something special going to happen, something important going to happen. And so my my wife and I went for a, a long weekend's holiday. Uh, I think it was around 2000, this was. And we went on a walk down from um, the little village that we lived in called Trollhattan, down a, a very woodland area through a pathway down to a river. And <clears throat> there was this river walk up towards a, 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 a suspension, pedestrian suspension bridge. We were going to cross over there. And as I walked down this this pathway, I could feel my body start to tingle, you know, first in the hands, then the arms, then the whole body. And I, I knew that I got to, in effect, stop and meditate. And I spotted this rock, which was in the water, but not far up away that I couldn't jump onto it. So I said to my, my wife and my friend, I'm going to sit here and meditate and I'll catch up with you. Well, they waited for me on this bridge, which is about half a kilometer away. <clears throat> and as I was meditating, I received what I can only describe as the most profound download I've ever had in my life. And when I finished it, like 20 minutes later, I, I couldn't I couldn't speak. I was I was I couldn't string three words together. But I noticed that I was I could see much more clearly than I could with my normal physical eyes. And my my wife and my friend, they came back to me and they said that they, they, they felt there was objects or craft or something over me, rewiring me for something I got to do later. They, they got this feeling it was, you're being prepared now for something later. And when they were saying that, I looked across the river <clears throat> and it was a dead calm day. But there was one area where the water was suddenly choppy. So it went from being a very flat river to being extremely choppy and again dead calm, but the but the trees were doing that. Just like the just like they would do with the downwash from a helicopter's rotor blades. And as I looked harder, I started to see an outline of these three, what I can only describe as being biomechanical craft that were over you know, they were sort of in that area, just disturbing the the energies in the area. As I looked harder and harder, I could see more and more detail. And then I had this booming voice in my head saying, don't, don't upset what we've just done. You, you need to let it settle. If you try hard, you'll, 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 you'll undo what we've done. And it was really, it's like somebody shouting at me. It was unbelievable. And um, so I thought, okay, fine. So I, so I, I stopped looking at them, stopped focusing, and it all disappeared. And the trees stopped stopped moving around, and the river suddenly became calm again. And and at that point onwards, my ability to move up and down the frequencies, to go to these different places, became easier and easier and easier. And I started to write down what I was experiencing. I originally called them my med meditational meanderings. And um, after about five years, five six years, I started to realise that what I'd got. I wasn't seeing it in any other books. I wasn't seeing it in books that were written by people like Neil Donald Walsh, Eckhart Tolle, 
other individuals, you know, even lobster and rampers work. I didn't, I, I, there was stuff that I was receiving or seeing and, and, and understanding that wasn't there. So I then just started to compile it together and created a, uh, a manuscript and submitted, submitted it to a number of different metaphysical and even standard publishers and, and nobody was interested um, apart from one, which was a self-publishing company. So I decided I was going to self-publish it first and that created the, the black book version of the history of God. But as soon as it was published, I had a call, phone call uh, from uh, Ozark Mountain Publishing, who was Dolores Cannon's publishing house. And they said they were interested in publishing it. And the rest is history. And there's now eight books on, on the bookshelves. There's a ninth one about to to arrive. And I'm working on a tenth. And we're doing some other work. Um, I'm compiling the work from some world satsangas that I used to do over the last 10 years. I'm still doing it. So your self-publishing effort got you a publisher? It seemed to, yes. It was the energy. It got the energy out there. You see, that's that's a, that's what I believe. It it made a it put the energy there that the the, the, that the information was there, and those are were interested. Um, okay, so all right, so um, I heard you tell that story before, where you saw the crab. Did you ever? Uh, did you ever come to an understanding of who was in the crowd? <clears throat> well, we're not even sure that they were that the craft wasn't the wasn't the entities. I I feel that it was a, a, a entities that were close to this this frequency that were not actually in this frequency but were outside of it, who were working for this group this this group of four entities that had visited me in my teenage years in one of my morning meditations. Right. I feel, I feel they're working for them because they they couldn't come down so low n normally to do, to do this sort of work. Um, and that's the that's the best thing I can I can say about it because I I then felt I had to go back. So for another four years afterwards, every year I would go back and go to the same place and I'll get another download of information. And it was really interesting because I took some photographs of the area. They're just like. Yeah, you know, pictures of the river, pictures of trees, pictures of the of the, the, the woodland bank. You know, with, with, with all these, all these earth is all these trees and this lichen are. And I showed them to a lady in a place called the College of Psychic Studies in South Kensington, London. And and without even talking to me, she looked at them. She said, "Oh, there's aliens there." <laughs> and she just knew. She said, "There's aliens there, and there's a there's a frequential portal. Call it a portal, if you want." So. There's a there's an area where they can move in. They can, they can move into the into into our our frequency from there and go back. So you're not sure that there was any actual aliens in the craft. You think it could have been the craft itself that was? Yeah. Yeah, because it was sentient. The craft itself was sentient. It it appeared to be like a biomechanical type of thing. It was almost like an upside down cone with octopus arms in the bottom. Really okay, so. You've been to all these different levels. Have you come to a level that you feel most likely represents where that craft came from? Mm, no, actually, I'm, I've never given it any thought. <laughs> um, I mean, you know what's on each level, right? You've been to each level, you've seen each level. A little bit. I mean, you, you can never know exactly what's on these levels in totality because we don't. Right, right, of course. Of course. Um, but, but you you have but you 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 experience the craft enough to have an idea of what level you if, if you had to guess mm. you might think well it's they like, were they were from the twelfth level so still the highest the, yeah still in the physical universe yeah I was just told I was just told they came from the twelfth level which is the top frequency associated with the physical universe oh you're talking about the twelfth level of this twelfth the twelfth yeah. dimension of this level well that, the the if we think of the physical universe as having 12 frequencies, and it's the only universe that has, <clears throat> then they came from the 12th frequency within... Of this universe? Yes. Okay. All right. So, but that's still at the... Is that the bottom? You said number one. We, yeah. are we Oh, here, here's, here's a question. Okay, so... Um, 
everybody believes or we come to believe based on what you hear that the hell realms if you believe hell realms exist you know if if you read like betty Eady's book beyond the light she talks about ltpes less than positive experiences where people go temporarily to hell hell ish realms while they're alive when they have an nd and it teaches them to basically live a better life not because they're going to go there when they die but just just as a here check this out if you really want to be a positive person go back and change your, your course of your life and it's not really a christian thing but it's similar and, and, and but we think of those realms as being within the astral plane the lower astral plane and so that's surrounding this plane but but i've also heard and i have no clue if this is right i heard somebody say that that there were 12 levels below this one and i'm like okay if we're at the center not not necessarily the bottom but the sort of the bottom center uh, you have like a if you shape it like a oval or something and then <clears throat> beyond that surrounding that you have the astral plane which has the hell realms in it if you believe that's true then that would be like all the way around it including below it but but that's not the same as saying there are 12 levels below this they're not as positive as this one so how do you how do you view the dark er places and how they I fit think, i think it's it's all to do with how people can understand the information based upon their own education and their own programming over their their, 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 their particular physical lifetime or incarnation if you look at it from the there's 12 levels of hell <laughs> below where we are basically that's that's looking in at the top of the frequencies associated with the physical universe isn't it we enter the physical universe and there's 12 levels below that's this that's the explanation for that basically when people um get drunk they get paralytic or they have some serious drugs they create a level of disharmony in the body <clears throat> and that disharmony is so strong that the, that the, the what i call the aspect of the higher self or the soul if you want to call it that has to get out because it's basically just dis disharmonious to it and it can only go back in again when the drugs have worn off and they've been the harmonies reassert themselves within the physical form but when they move out they move out depending upon how how strong the drugs were they they get they get thrown out either a long way or frequently into the higher astral levels which are the sixth and seventh frequencies associated with the physical universe we can't see them they're, the height, they're much higher than our our eyes can see or or our hearing and, and, and our smell and our taste or even our machines can see but nevertheless they're still there um, or if it's not so much of a disharmonious condition but still enough to throw the soul out or the, the soul needs to get out it goes into the lower astral levels which is the fourth and fifth level and in those levels we see other entities that are here that are incarnate entities like us but at a higher frequency level which may not be human bodies and we also see other entities that are created by thought forms or the natural Darwin, darwinian evolution of energy what we call lower astri, astral entities and so they can see these things and these things can have all sorts of weird wonderful frightening shapes depending upon how they want to interact with us because sometimes they create a a really grotesque shape or they look into our fears to present themselves as this shape so that we don't see them so we choose not to see them we, we, we don't want to see that which frightens us so we look away and we look away both mentally and and psycho spiritually so we don't perceive them as well so we tend to so we tend to not see them but when we when our soul is thrown out of the body through taking significant levels of drugs or alcohol we can now see them Provided we stay conscious, <laughs> if we don't, if we're not conscious, then we don't see these sorts of things. But in these de levels, even the fourth level, we would be able to experience more communicative bandwidth, and therefore contact in a more coherent way our higher self, and therefore understand more. So that's when we start to 
receive information about how we, we probably need to change our life course to make the best out of our existence here so we, we improve our evolutionary potential <clears throat> and that's my that's my understanding it's it's a it's a bit more structured than you know we, we have hell we the hell is where we are now basically because in comparison to what we normally can do and how we normally exist this is like trying to walk through concrete in comparison you know we've lost hundreds of different types of sensory ways in which we communicate uh, we're, we're down to five which are, which are inefficient at best so you believe that the astral realm is where the dark where the less than positive realms exist is that is that correct it's it's it again it's it's not less than positive it's just how it's how we individually experience them if we if we suddenly find ourselves turning a corner in the street we see somebody being mugged that's a bad experience if we turn the same corner three days later we don't see it we just we just see the street it's a positive experience it's just how we experience it at that point not what it's like all of the time and i think from from what i what i've experienced myself is we have to consider that all the environments have the potential to be everything and we can we can create what we want to see or we get attracted to what we expect to see when we go um, outside of the body for the final time or, or we have these near-death experiences we can go out of the of the of the physical realms even out of the, the physical universe and we can create a construct around ourselves that equals what we expect to see so you know if, if we're a christian we might expect to see jesus or God on a throne, for example. If we are <clears throat> Hindu, we'd expect to see uh, Krishna. If we are an atheist, we expect to experience nothing. We end up going into like a mental limbo. But we can create what we whatever we want to in these higher levels because we are ultimately very, very powerful creators. And we're part of a much larger piece, volume of, of sentience and energy. Before you mentioned... Uh that one of the realms that you chose to go to was the 36th realm. Go back, uh, explain what uh, attracted to, the, to that realm, what it's like and why you well, were <clears throat> Well, that was an example. The, the one realm, that the one sort of frequency that I was attracted to a, a lot was the 27th frequency, because that was the first entity I managed to contact and eventually persuade to communicate with me and give me information about the structure of the multiverse above what I was currently experiencing and you know, what we really are um, and, and this entity. Can, can you describe uh, that experience with that entity? Uh, can you re-describe it as in take the audience through that experience when you first saw it or you know experienced it? Can you yeah. get into that? Is it yeah. impossible? Yeah, I mean, basically, I went to this level and there was this black dragon entity there. <laughs> and it said to me quite forcefully, ah, you're a human. You shouldn't be here. You should you know, leave <laughs> as soon as you can. And I thought, oh, that's, not, <laughs> that's interesting. A black dragon telling me that I should go. Hmm. I didn't feel any fear at all. And I, I, I kept going there every day, and this dragon would do the same thing. No, you should be not here. You're not part of this level. Go away. And I think it took me probably six months, almost every day of going there, or every other day going there, and saying, look, you know, I want to talk to you. And it eventually capitulated and said, OK, I'll, I'll give you a human body to look at. And it manifested this human form. and. It then said, oh, "I'll give you a name as well. You can you can use." And it it must have looked into my mind because where I used to work, which was an automotive company called Lucas, there was an area that was generated by a chap called Lord Byron, and it said, oh, "You can call me Byron." And he gave me the image of this 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 old gentleman called Lord Byron, <laughs> and and he did then he just just but he, he gave me this this image just as a focus basically because it was because of the 27th level which is it is still quite a low frequency it's still not physical so 
it would have presented itself in a a ball or an amorphous form of sentience and energy. But it uses this to, to make it easier for me. And it started to communicate and I got lots of information from it. And a lot of the information out of the history of God was was born through the communications with Byron. So Byron was the name of the human. Did he yeah. say that was his human name or his real name? No, no, he just used it as a, as a focus. It wasn't his name at all. He just used that image that was in my mind at the time. Um, and he said, oh, you can, you, Lord Byron was a, um, <clears throat> an innovator, somebody who worked on trying to improve the living standards of people in the area that I used to work in. And he said, oh, you can use that because I'm going to improve your knowledge. And, it's, and that, was, that was a sort of link but it created and it used that image as a means of communicating with me. How long, how many times would you say, roughly speaking, that you went and talked to him? It? Just roughly, ballpark. Probably hundreds. Hundreds? hundreds. Yeah, hundreds. How long, over how long of a period of time in your life? Uh, <clears throat> I would ballpark, say, doesn't have to be accurate. Uh, probably seven years. Seven years, okay. And that, and which book came out of that? History of God was the first book. There was other entities as well I was communicating with, including the source and its creator, the origin, which I've since found out was called, is what the Hindus call the, the, the absolute, that which is beyond God, which is also sentience. Um, I've, and I've, since then, I've, I've had little, I don't read books, I haven't read any metaphysical books for, well, since since the year 2000, because I felt I, I shouldn't, because it would be in the back of my mind and, and then be sort of regurgitated later. But on, on the other occasion, I've picked up a book quite randomly and opened a page quite randomly, just for whatever reason. And the information there has, has indicated the information I've been getting completely independently. So I've been given these little... Um, <clears throat> Little tick in the boxes saying, yes, you're on the right direction every, every now and then, just to say that it's, uh, it's, it's right. So if you were another person and not you, and you and you came upon a table and on this table, you had all of your books that you've written spread out. And you had you can only read one of them. You cannot read any other book, but the one book, which of all your books that you've written, would you would you as this other person read? Should read. Not, that, not that depend. you would pick the right book. You yeah, wouldn't necessarily would, pick the right book because you're another person. But having <laughs> the knowledge you have, you can tell us which book. If somebody has to have one of your books is the most essential book that you have, which book? Go, would? go for the first one because that is at the the, the basic level. And which it, is the history of God. That's the history. The first. Of, okay. That's the that's, actually that's the best selling book. That's my best selling book. Which is interesting. The rest, the rest, grow from there, and you can see me growing from there as well, which is which is the the interesting part. But if if you dive into the other books, there's a couple of books which are standalone, like Avoiding Karma and the And Dialogues. Um, but the others all are like linear, lin, linearly sequential from each other. So this the history of God beyond the source one, beyond the source two, uh, the origin speaks. And the curators, they they move sequentially. So, and you start to see the use of terminology grow as well, as I'm told to use different terminology for different uh, concepts. So of all these different levels you've been to, is there a level that is your preference now? No? No, no, no. Okay, so is there a level that you know better, besides the level you're on, which you and I know the best. Is there another level that you've been to that you know the best, better than the rest? No, but I, I do know that I don't exist when I'm in, in the energetic. I don't exist within the multiverse environments that we recognize as being our multiverse. I exist outside of it. Um, but that's You're talking about your, your higher self. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I, <clears throat> it exists beyond that. Whereas most people's higher selves exist within the multiverse as part of the evolutionary cycle there. I'm I'm told, and I've been told by other people as well, completely independent, who are also psychics. Um, some of them are really good quality psychics as well. Certainly 
with one or two that have sort of corroborated the information quite independently that have been um, working in the College of Psychic Studies in South Kensington, London, which is a very high quality psychic uh, metaphysical college. They've all said you, you're not from this, you're not from this multiverse at all. You're from somewhere else. What was her name? Um, the, the one lady was, uh, was Val. Who was the other lady who was there? There was, this is a long time ago now, probably 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, Val, Val Gordon is the one lady. She's the best one there, I feel. Valerie Gordon. And uh, so Barbara Brennan, uh, uh, I, I assume you've read her uh, Hands of Light. Okay. And what other books of hers have you read besides that? Um, Light Emerging, basically. And there's a third. There's a third book I've not read. Because okay, so Hands of Light and Light Emerging. I used to have a copy of Hands of Light. I never read it. I glanced through it. I saw the images and I understood uh, the chakras and all that um, based on the level that she was talking about. So if you um, if you think about the human as being uh, it, let, let's say for a moment, just for the sake of argument, that she's correct, that we have a pole down our center of energy, and then we have uh, chakras that that are uh, horizontal, um, hourglass shaped, vaguely, going forward and backward. Uh, do you, do you, A, do you uh, agree with that? B, what else have you if anything, have you come to understand about humans beyond that? Well, my understanding is that the the Hara line is what, what what connects us to our higher self. Basically, there's another thing called the silver cord, which which people also should know about, which is when we still when we the soul moves out the body, astral traveling is that's the, one of the things that connects that keeps the soul connected. But in essence, the the Hara line is is the connection between the higher self and the body. There's a place called, that, that Barbara calls the um, core star, which is the the junction of where the sentience and the energy splits into energy that goes to the Tantien to animate the body, and the sentience which goes into a place called the soul seat, which is behind the uh, connection between the front and rear heart chakras. And so that's where we, as sentience and energy, sit in the body. And the, the chakras are there basically to animate the body by using the frequencies on seven levels. And each chakra is effectively an energy receiver for, for one of these different levels. And there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an energy template associated to a particular chakra that is part of the, the overall building blocks that creates the, that creates the human form and other forms, not just human form, it's the other forms as well within the physical universe. So the chakras are, I mean, Barbara's understanding of the chakras is, is the best to be honest is is, is, is is very similar to if not exactly the same as what i've experienced um i i do feel that she confused the astral um sorry the auric layers with the energy templates because i see them as i see the there's different energy templates and there's the the waste product of the of the metabolization of, i'll use that word of of energy through the chakras to animate the, the 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 different energy templates on these different seven levels and the waste product is the different levels or different layers of, of, of the of the of the of the human energy field or, or the the auric layers around us. If, if you think about the waste product from a, from a light bulb is heat and electromagnetic radiation, that's the similar sort of thing. There's always a waste product in the physical universe. If so although energy is never lost, there's always something going on specifically with, with, with these low frequencies. So I see that, that I, I see a, a different level of information uh, above what, what Barbara did. But what Barbara's presenting to the world is a really good basic starting point, without doubt. <clears throat> so are you familiar with the sounds you would hear if you stuck your thumbs in your ears? Yes, you can hear the, if you do that as well. Right. You can hear, so the, bass, you can hear, the, you can hear the bass resonant frequency of the, of, of the 
well, the multiverse basically. Um, so what when you stick your thumbs in your ears, what which sound do you hear? Well, you hear the collective bass resonant frequency of everything, which is classified as being um, it's a bit like hearing this hearing the sea roar in the distance. Right. <clears throat> okay. Do you know what Ekankar is? Sorry? Ekankar, have you ever heard of it? Ekankar? It's a religion. Uh, E-C-K-A-N-K-A-R, I think it's how they uh, spelled. There's a chart. Uh, if you later on, after you get off of this uh, uh, interview, you can, there's a, if you Google it, the worlds of Ek, E-C-K, and when you, you know, Google that, the worlds of Ek, and hit go, hit uh, OK or whatever the button is, and then instead of looking at the the um, returns below, you choose um, images, and you click on images, you'll you'll get one or two copies of that image available in Google Images, and so if you go look at that chart, you're going to see basically a big oval. Uh, drawing and each I mentioned before the the different levels like uh, the physical plane, the astral plane, the causal plane, the mental plane, the etheric plane and so forth being uh, duality planes in the bottom and then a line and then non-dualistic above that that's their concept but aside from that or as part of that if you go look at that chart one thing you'll notice is on the outside edge of the chart on both both outside edges on the oval that goes, you know, like the outside of an oval, uh, an oval, a flattened oval. Um, you're gonna on one of those two edges, you're gonna see um, the sound you hear when you put your thumbs in your ears of that level. In other words, um, if I go ask a bunch of people, stick your thumbs in your ears. And then hold it there for a minute and then take them out and tell me what you hear. If I do that to a whole bunch of different people, I'm going to get different answers. But the sound they hear is associated, if you look at that chart, with a particular plane of existence. The roar of the ocean, I think, if I'm not mistaken, is the physical plane. And I think the astral plane is like thunder. Or it could be vice versa. I can't remember which is which, but one of the one of the the Earth is either, or the physical plane is either thunder or roar of the sea, and then the astral is the other one. And so, I hear um, what you're saying: the either the roar of the ocean or thunder. Without the beginning of the thunder and the end of the thunder, what mm. happens in the middle uh, <clears throat> part of the thunder? It's either one of those two sounds that I hear. And they say if you, if, well, my experience is if you hold your thumbs and ears and you hold just the right amount of pressure, you're going to hear that and it's getting louder and louder and louder and louder. Okay. So that's one thing that's, um, I assume that's a part of you being you're that whole thing and you're the, you're this little piece, but you're also the whole thing. And uh, so, um, I guess I just got into that because I thought, Okay, so there's another piece. Um, I, I was once sitting on my couch and uh, for uh, at a particular year in my life in Houston, and uh, as I'm sitting there, I had what's called the music of the spheres mm. come on. Now, uh, you know who Ingo Swan is, right? No, I don't know Ingo Swan, no. Okay, so Ingo Swan is probably the world's most famous remote viewer. Uh, he's he was uh, he worked for the CIA and the, uh, through um, a um, a college in, uh, level in, uh, corporation and uh, anyway uh, those remote viewers let's see what was I going to say I got off track uh, they're um, geez I didn't lost it okay so anyway. Uh, oh yeah, the 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 uh, the music of spheres. Okay, so Ingo and um, 
he was a psychic spy, basically used his mind to go pick up data from the Russians and other places. And uh, um, he had a, a buddy who was not part of his, uh, was not part, was not a remote viewer, but his name was D. Scott Rojo. He wrote, D. Scott Rojo and Ingo Swan together, they went astrally or out of body projecting to Mercury um, and looked at Mercury before our probes reached there and said, Mercury, that planet, the atmosphere is stretched out to the side. And when our probes got there, our probes proved that what he saw was correct. Okay. So, um, so his buddy that, that did that, uh, that traveling and checking out Mercury with him before our probes got there and was confirmed later as being accurate, D. Scott Rojo wrote a book called NAD colon space music of the spheres. Now he describes what I was experiencing uh, th two or three times on my couch one day when I lived in Houston 30 years ago. And so this music of the spheres is basically, uh, he the way he described it in the book, he said that you'll hear it um, when you're you know, on rare occasions when you're dying and on other rare occasions when you're getting out of your body. But it's a very rare event. And so I heard it like two or three times. And what I heard was, uh, it was like, um, it was like, did you ever see the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so at the beginning of the movie, the apes are running around and they've got these obelisks and they hear this music, they hear this sound, it sounds like angels singing, ah! Okay, if you take that sound and at the end of that same movie, uh, Hal is the supercomputer in the spaceship is not allowing the astronaut to get back in the spaceship. And when they gave a sound, it was supposed to represent the sound of space. Now in space, there is no sound because there's no air to, to carry sound. But they gave a particular sound to represent space. And it was kind of a, a shell, you know, put your shell over your ear type of sound. If you combine those two sounds together, the angel singing and the, and the shell, that's what I heard. And that's what D. Scott Rowe calls music of the spheres. Now, when I heard it, I uh, I thought it was outside of me. When I first started hearing it, it was very faint. And I thought it was coming from outside of me. And it started getting louder and louder and louder until it was very loud. And then the second thing I noticed was my ears were vibrating. Okay. And then I realized it, the sound was coming from inside of me. It was coming from my center, from my being. Okay. So that's something I wasn't hearing the universe. I was hearing myself mm -hmm. turned on. And so I just wanted to throw that past you because um, that's sort of one of those things where when you think about what is a human, you might think of, well, uh, if Bar Barbara is talking about the, the pole of energy that goes straight up your center, out the top of your head and down through blow to you know down like up into infinity and down it's one straight pole that your chakras are feeding into right mm -hmm. and then another part is you know, all your uh different layers of your uh of your auras like the one around, immediately around your body it's very thin and that's one aura and it, usually people see it as white when they first see it and then there's all these other cor colored auras that are much further out than your body. So basically what I'm doing is, is I'm uh, saying that the music of the spheres and the sound you hear in your ears when you put your thumbs in your ears and the chakras uh, chakras, and the auras around you and all this stuff. Oh, and there's one more thing. The That's all part of who you are. And after, remember I mentioned earlier that I did the, uh, the ayahuasca? Mm -hmm. It opened me up. Okay, so it, within those two years of being opened up, I saw, you know, dark, a lot of dark stuff. But but that stuff could see me. It was a two-way street, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so 
what we would hear, my wife and I would be in bed and we would be sleeping with our two dogs in between us. And there would be like somebody set off a hand grenade in the living room, this explosion. There's no shock wave, but you got this loud sound, boom, right in the, like coming from the other room next to, you know, the living room. And I would get up, the dogs would jump up and start barking their heads off because everybody heard it. it wasn't in my head. Everybody heard it. I go in the living room, there's nothing there, right? And then uh, at other times, you would, I, we would hear, or I would hear, uh, like a knocking, like something is banging, on, not on the wall, because my wife and I had heard rapping, like you hear from ghosts and stuff. That's, that's mm -hmm. not what I'm talking, I'm not talking about that. This is different. This is like it's banging on something that's outside the wall and a much harder bang, not a little knock. OK, we would hear that. Or I would hear that. And so basically what I'm telling you is, is that when you do the like when you do pot, when you do alcohol, when you do smoke cigarettes, you open yourself up like Swiss cheese to attaching spirits. That's a part of you uh, as far as, you know, that that barrier is a part of you. And then if you take the ayahuasca or some of the hallucinogens, uh, more stronger drugs, you're opening up that that um, the barriers that are outside the wall that are further out away from you. OK, so basically I'm just uh, kind of trying to wrap my head around all these different levels of what you mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah. So with the <clears throat> some of the noises you'll hear, the sounds you'll hear are also the resonant frequencies of the individual chakras as well. And so the, the, the one that we hear collectively is usually what we call tinnitus, which, which is the all of the resonant frequencies of the chakras in one go, which is very confusing. It becomes like a single noise. But if you can li link into each of the chakras separately, you'll start to hear difference. You know, music from the spheres, basically. And, there's the, and they do have a different no, different sound for each of them. And, it, and it's quite, you know, some of that, that clucking of harps, some of it's like, like angels sort of, uh, yeah, as you just described, like the start of 2001. There's other other noises that they make as well, which are quite bizarre, but very, very sort of distinguishing. And you have to be able to go to these levels of, and focus on the chakras to be able to hear these things. And it does take quite a bit of um, practice. Let's put that way. So um, now that you've learned all these different things about the levels of reality, um, and besides writing your books and besides teaching people, I assume you're, you consider yourself a metaphysician. That's your primary. Yeah, I'm still, still learning that. <laughs> of, know, course. of course, of yeah, I mean, course. <clears throat> I classify myself as a, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a metaphysician. Yeah, basically a sort of spiritual physicist, you want to call it that. Um, just somebody who is experiencing something and is helping others to experience it and trying to know more. And, and you know, helping others know more. So all yeah. of these different, all these different levels that you've that you've um, learned about. What what have they? What benefit is there for you as a human now that you understand that they exist? Other than you can write a book about it and teach people about it. What it? What what's the largest? Or uh, what's the? Uh, give us some benefits that you gain from having the knowledge. And experiences you've had well basically it allows you to detach from the physical so you can be in the physical not be of the physical so um, that you're not scared of the future you're not you're not worried about the future you know you're not focused on the past you're in the present yeah it's like you've had a near-death experience where you That's where you're it's, not you're yeah. not attached to it too much no it's 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 basically a freedom because you understand more about who what you are and you recognize that you know, where we are now is just like a journey where we've got one, you know, a vehicle to use. And that vehicle just happens to be the human body at this point in time. It could be a different body, a different planet in a different galaxy, a different frequency in, a, in another, in the next incarnation. It's a bit like, you know, hiring a car. <laughs> you know, if we think of ourselves as the, as the soul getting into the car and the car is the body, then we, we animate the car That's the length of time we need to animate. Be able to travel from A to B. Then we give it back or we discard it. So we, we 
but she dies in a sequel. It's, uh, you know, if we keep it long enough, and that's the way I see it. It's, it's just we are just here to experience live and evolve. So you're not overly attached to your current situation. Yeah. I need to take a real quick break. If you need a break, uh, this is a good time. Yeah, well, I've not, I've not got a lot of time left. It's it's uh, what's the time? It's ten past ten here. In the, in the, in the, so. Okay, let me take a real quick break and then we'll finish it. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I thought about one or two questions before while I was gone. Mm -hmm. um, how many how many books have you written so far? Um, there's eight published, um, and there's one more about to be about to be published. It's the, the, we just agreed the cover design, so it'll be available in Amazon. I would say if not in December, certainly in January. Must be the ninth. There's two other books that I'm working on. Um, along with another lady called Ulla Samiento, who's transcribed and compiled the information from what I call World Satsangi, which is when I had um, basically a questions and answers session held over Skype and then later on Zoom, um, where the lectures there associated with lots of questions and answers surrounding what I call the greater reality. And the, and the answers are channeled answers, so on the spot channeled answers. And that's all being created into two books. There will be a third book associated. Who was channeling? You, her, you or her? Me. Okay. So you channel? Yeah. So channel work from, yeah. So basically the questions were asked, were asked and I either knew the answers straight away because I know the knowledge, uh, or I channeled the answers uh, straight away to, to get the information. Who or what do you channel? It can be either well these days it's usually either the source one of the one of the group of entities called the um or, or the origin but usually when ch channeling information i don't specifically now contact a particular entity i'll just get i'll just go into the higher frequencies and, and pick up the information because it's, it's already there it's, it's it's already there so you're saying you go there and basically you're talking from that level mm. as yourself so you're not really channeling at all. You're, you're just part of you is going there, picking up the information, and you're speaking it while your awareness is uh, is at a different level. Yeah, that's what I, I would classify that as channeling. But so. well, I think of channeling as being uh, as you're allowing something else to speak through you. Ah, uh, something else. Yeah, that's that's. Well, uh, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I, yeah, I understand what you're saying. That's I was I was in a church one time, and we were having this circle discussion of uh, I won't go into it too much, but I was started talking to this one fellow, and what I started saying was not it's not knowledge that I had; it was coming from somewhere else. But I didn't get into any special aware, uh, level or, of awareness to get this knowledge. It was like my higher self is speaking through me spontaneously. Mm. And I wasn't trying to make it happen. But I knew as I spoke it, I knew the information wasn't coming from my conscious mind because I didn't know the information. Mm -hmm. But I assume that's kind of what you're doing. Yes? It's, yeah. And, and people think of 
channeling as being, you know, your you your consciousness, your sentience moves out of the body, and another entity comes in. That's that's one way of doing it, but but which basically is then limited towards you other people communicating with this other entity or the sentience in your body. Whereas my what I do is, is I move my sentience into two locations really, one here and one where I need to go to to get the information. It just comes into me. I mean, what you what you've just shared with me there is that is is, is a automatic function where you you just intuitively know the information and you talk about it um, because it's there and you and you know it's you feel it's right and that's that's a that's a that's a different thing as well. But that, 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 but to be honest, it's all classic. It can all be classified as different levels of channeling. Really, you're channeling channeling higher information from where it comes from to the physical. So one thing you mentioned was source and origin as if it's two different things. So explain mm. that. Well, <laughs> basically, the origin created the source so that it could, in effect, along with other sources, um, create a function of parallel processing in terms of its own experience of self and therefore the ability to accrue evolutionary um, content. And our source basically divided itself into two. One, of, one was a certain level of its structure and then also populated it with smaller individualized units of its own sentience to experience the minute detail of that structure. Minute detail, one of those minute details being our physical universe. So the origin was the beginning and source is, there are more than one, so, uh, there's many sources so we come from source and source came from origin. Correct. Okay. All right. Well, uh, is there, are you okay with people reaching out to you after this? If somebody watches this and they want to reach out to you uh, and ask you a question or get, maybe they'd like to be your student or get out of a session or whatever, for any reason, uh, are you open to that? Yes, people do already. <laughs> so, so basically, if they look at the website, which is www.beyondthesource.org, and the the email is info at beyondthesource.org. Okay, so that's your web page and your email address. Yeah. Okay. And uh, is there anything you want to say to the people listening that uh, is of a positive note that uh, you want to leave them with mm. at the, as the show ends? The way to understand reality is through meditation. That is without doubt the, the most fundamental gateway to being able to connect with the higher frequencies and therefore other entities that are, that are there and also increase your community value to meditate. Well, I appreciate your time. Uh, I know you had some other things you had to do, so we had to make it a little shorter. But if uh, you're ever open to being on the show again, uh, ha have you you mentioned four beings that showed up? Uh, how many have you come across other? You, and you mentioned the dragon, right? Mm. So those two different ones. How many other types of beings have you come across in your journeys? Well, there was a group of aliens, you know, call them aliens. I, I, I don't, they're not using the word alien basically because they're just other incarnate bodies that we use to to, to experience the, the physical universe in. Um, they were based in Crete. Um, they were observing the human beings in, in Crete. You're talking about physical aliens? Yeah, but a, but a higher frequency to us. So in the, the sort of fourth, fourth frequency level, what we call the lower astral levels, still incarnation, but a higher frequency level of incarnation. How did you come across them? Give us the, a brief version of that encounter. Basically, I was meditating and I, and I realized I was being watched. And I sort of then gazed my eyes around the environment. I was meditating on top of a roof, roof, a roof terrace. And I noticed that the, where I was, the energy that was, that was focused on me was coming from a mountain. And when I focused on them, I realized there was like a, like a, like a base, almost like a balcony built into the mountain, but at a different frequency. And there was um, entities there 
observing craft coming and going. And uh, they were there to observe, just observing the difference between the older Greeks and the younger Greeks, and they're trying to understand how they could get how they could become so materialistic in the space of a generation. And that's what they're observing. So, do these beings have a name, or do they, uh, let's say, uh, you say from a higher level, like a fourth dimension or fifth dimension? Do they, are they, do they yeah. huh? fourth frequency? Okay, they're just above, just above where we are now. Okay. And are when you encountered them, were they were on our level or still on their level? What, still on their level. They, on? they were still on their level. So mm. your ex, your awareness was expanded to that level at the, in that moment. Mm. Yes. Okay. And so if they were watching uh, craft coming and go from a mountain, you're saying that they're existing on their level and our level. They're observing us on our level. But because from they above. Can. Yeah, yeah, but from above, yeah. Uh, okay, but they were physically in the mountain. Hmm. They were in yeah. that space, yeah. but at a higher level. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I do very much appreciate your taking the time to be on my show. And uh, I hope you get plenty of new sales from my show. I hope people uh, help you out. And I wish you Thank the you. best of luck. <laughs> and all your efforts, and I will now stop the recording. Thank you very much again for being on the show. Thank you, sir.